you know why you're the best option for a company that you're talking to as a potential customer. And I promise you, it's probably not the physical stuff you're building as an exhibit. It is you. It's the way you've communicated. It's the content you've put before them. Content isn't just a copy in your brochure anymore or on your website. I think it's become the number one influencer that your customers are making spend decisions with you about. Strong companies, lasting partnerships, powerful events. Welcome to the Experience Builders Podcast. Chris, officially Q2. How is Q1? Uh, Q1 was very strong for us. Q2 already we can see it's going to be even better. So excited. And I'm like, what, one day in to Q2? <laughs> but no, it's a great feeling. And, you know, the only thing that keeps me from breaking into song right now is um, I know what the summer's like, uh, the cliff dive in the, in the trade show summer slowdown. So that reality is out there. But, man, we're having a lot of fun right now. It's great. Well, good. I, I appreciate you making time for this episode in the midst of it all. Uh, I know it's kind of hectic whenever you're in this busy season, but um, you know, you we're talking about content today, and I think that's probably one of the most common excuses that you get from people with content. They they know that they need to do it, or they they have this inkling that they need to start creating content, but they let the busyness and the um, the to do list get in the way of actually going and doing content. Uh, so we're going to talk about a lot of areas, but thank you for making time to make content, uh, even in the midst of the chaos. Can I put that in my LinkedIn profile clip, content maker, <laughs> content manufacturer? Um, you know what? I, so creator. this is a word I know a lot of the experience builder listeners, we've all heard it for years. It, for some reason, I'm internalizing it a lot more since I became um, active in, in a podcast. But for those that are maybe not as engaged, let's just make sure we have a common you know, definition of what it means. Um, so content really is the, it's the subject or idea that's contained in something that's written, spoken, or represented. So if you think about that, I mean, it's, it really is the content is the idea that your contribution is communicating. So mm -hmm. um, I started thinking about what does that include? Well, I, you know, you and, I, you and I were talking just before we, we started recording. Um, I've got three people that got on airplanes today to go see clients to it shows, one at their office out in, in San Francisco. Um, the narrative and the discussion that happens is content. The slide deck that may or may not be up on a screen is content. The website things we just updated are content. Um, your LinkedIn posts, your Instagram, or as the young kid says, the gram, right? This, the stuff you put on Instagram or Facebook, um, this po you know, a podcast interview that you might do on a, a show like this, like Experience Builders. Um, how about your TikTok video? All of those things are putting forth an extension of you or your company your your ideas, your values, your principle, what whatever, and people are gonna judge you. Sometimes it's your company, sometimes it's your personal brand. By the way, I think all of us know Khalil, people that have misstepped with messaging or dare I say content. Um, and it's hurt them professionally and it's hurt their company and their companies distance themselves. Um, so I just content isn't just the copy in your brochure anymore, right? Or on your website. It's become, I, my opinion, I think it's become the number one influencer that your customers are making spend decisions with you about. Remember when it used to be, um, it was just the, the product, the, you, you sold the product and it was the features and benefits of the product. And I think there's a lot of really great products out there now. And I just think, the people representing 
representing those products, the relationships they have with you. Very often, based on how you meet and in the business world, we're usually meeting over content, whether it's at a conference or it's a web lead because I saw your offering, right? And all of a sudden, our relationship is well underway before I kick the tires on your product. So that's what I mean when I say, I think it's becoming the most influential thing. So yeah, it seemed to me like well, it would be I, a great time for a discussion about how meaningful it is in our lives. For sure. You know, inbound marketing is what it was coined by, I believe, HubSpot yeah. back in, gosh, yeah. 2009 or something like that. And I think it really marked a shift. You know, we all carry around our phones now. And we've got access to content on multiple channels, uh, whether that's LinkedIn or Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, like you mentioned, uh, websites, apps, whatever it is. And back in the day, going to buy a car, for example, the, the power was in the hands of the seller because they had all the knowledge. Right? It's the you only place you could lot. get the content, right? You had to go to the dealership. The only place you get to the content. You had to go to the dealership. You figure out oh, wow, okay, how much does this car cost? You have no idea. What's the mileage? Uh, tell me about this make and model. You know, you had to go to the dealership to get the information. Maybe you could get a magazine sent to you where it has all the specs listed out or whatever. But for the most part, you're going to the dealership and you had no power. All the power was in the hands of the seller. But this has been true for over a decade now. The power is in the hands of the buyer because content is readily available. For sure. Anyway, if you yeah. want to go to a, I don't know many people who go to buy a car without Googling it first and just show up on the lot these days. And probably know more about that car than the sales They usually know more, meeting. more, yeah, more than the salesperson, right? I can get because, the car facts. I can learn the history. I've, yeah. you know, I'm buying a pre-owned car and I've looked at 10 just like it. Whereas he's got one of them on a lot with 300 cars. He's probably not memorized. You're absolutely right, Khalil. I, I think all of the leverage shifts to the, the buyer side. It shifts to the buyer. So if you're not creating content, then you are not giving the knowledge necessary for the buyer to make the decision that they're trying to make. And so you're missing out on the opportunity to educate buyers before they even have a conversation with you, right? Well, can I huge. ask you a question? I love your analogy. Yeah. This is a great analogy with the cars. I remember going with my dad a couple of times when I was younger and he was car shopping. And at some point I'd hear him talking with my mom at night about what he saw and who he felt was trustworthy or credible. Right. And so would, is it fair to say that the content that, so just like they're able, that buyer is able to check out the car or excuse me, the, the product before they get to the lot. Fair to say they can check you out also? Oh, absolutely. I mean salesperson, whatever you're offering is. So my point espe is especially as a especially as a service provider, uh, people aren't buying what you do most of the time. They're buying why you do it. Simon Sinek talks about it like that. Yeah. And they also want to know how you do it. They want to know more about you, your company. They they buy why you do it and how you're doing it. Right. So it's not enough just to say that we offer a service. You've got to explain why you're offering that service, why people are choosing you. You've got to outline the benefits, the challenges, the obstacles, the misconceptions, uh, you know, the process, all these different things that they have questions about. Um, there's a great book by, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, Sheridan, Marcus Sheridan. And it's called They Ask, You Answer. And he did a great oh, yeah, job of this in the- in the late 2000s, uh, early 2010s, of any time a a, there was a question asked by a customer, he answered it, and he did it in the format of a blog. And pretty soon, he became he became the biggest carbon pool, carbon fiber pool manufacturer in the nation from the blog. Um, and so that that's just how it works. You know, if people have questions and you're the one that's answering, they're likely going to trust you to answer the other questions they have. And then ultimately, because you're so knowledgeable, feel like they can trust you to buy from you as well. So it's funny, I, this became very personal for me when pandemic hit. I mean, I'm a guy that's been in an industry for over three decades. Know a mm -hmm. lot of people. We see each other all at the industry events. 
And when pandemic hit and we, our industry was shuttered, um, I became, I, you know, I was like a, the poster guy for what many were doing, which is trying to learn about government aid and how am I going to stay alive? And I really didn't think my business was going to make it. And so I took to YouTube in the airwaves as we were doing advocacy to try and update people. But a lot of those, if you, you go back and you look at those old YouTube clips, it was me really confessing. It was, it was almost like the long goodbye. But what <laughs> my point is, I threw myself in the advocacy because I thought, okay, well, at the very least, I might end up I know I could probably get a job with a company that does make it, but um, I became about a cause. It really, the intent was not to get a job. It was just to sort of document what we was going through. And when we'd find places, you can get PPP money or short-term loan or state. Anyway, it, um, my personal brand, net, not intentional, but the personal brand kind of grew. And anyway, all that yeah. stuff is still out there because I still get people that will come up to me and go, man, thank you so much for you know, what you did. I always just remind people, like, there's a lot of people doing it. Like when I watched all your movies, I'm like, movies, you know, these were, these were really just, um, anyway, it was, it's now considered content. Right. And, um, what I learned was, um, what got me through was the wisdom of sharing it was great conversations, which ultimately I thought should be shared. And it was the, it was the purpose behind starting this podcast. And anyway, i I'm saying all this because um, it's literally changed how how we do business, Khalil. And so yeah. um, I'm just driven. I have a very unique business model. Like many of the listeners, you know, if you're listening right now, you know why you're the best option for a company that you're talking to as a potential customer, or you know why your mm -hmm. customers are with you. And I promise you, it's probably not the physical stuff you're building as an exhibit. It is it is you. It's the integrity of, of, of you. It's the way you've communicated. It's the content you've put before them, either in one-on-one -on -one presentations or Zoom calls or um, maybe your proposals are just better looking and, 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 and easier to understand. I mean, all of that, in my view, is I, I kind of view as content. And like you said, um, and Sheridan is right, explaining how you do it. I really believe that the method of how you do business, if if it's purposeful, that could be a reason even more than what your final output offering is that people choose you. Um, he makes it easy. It's easy to understand. Yeah. I know what I have to do. He invoices me every Thursday. I don't have to worry about you know, did I pay? Did I not pay? He'll know that. Um, my artwork, I got a I got a PDF file. It's it's in my speed it's, it's in my speed folder because I'm always doing artwork and I know exactly how to set it up. I know it's going to yeah. take X amount of day, right? Anyway, I know what their terms are. I, this is, um, yeah. So, uh, the, 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 so the purpose is, is as I see more people waking up to the fact that it's not just the product you're selling, but it's, it's, it's how you're putting your message, your narrative out there. Um, yeah. I see a lot of people maybe that are I, a little cringy when I see how some of the, the messaging gets put forth, Khalil. So I'm, I, I thought we might speak to that a little bit. You're a guy that, you know, you're the professional company that I hire to produce my podcast. You do a great job at it. I've learned so much from Thank you. you. And you, I know you do this for other companies. So um, give my listeners a, a nice big gift right now and take a couple minutes. Hmm. What are the tips you'd give somebody that's, waking up to this. And I don't just mean doing a podcast. I'm talking about the sure. importance of how you put that message out. What, what could you offer somebody who's trying to get serious? about this? Well, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Um, I think there's so many tips that we can go through and I've got some written down here that I'll, I'll get through, but don't overcomplicate it. Do something that's feasible for you. And that's real for you. You do not need to create a podcast. You do not need to get on TikTok. There are different ways that you can make content. And you have to do what is actually feasible and natural to you. Yeah, you're going to have to get out of your comfort zone a little bit. But if you hate being on camera, that's likely not going to change overnight. So don't start with just getting on camera. Maybe you're just writing emails. Maybe you're um, going in recording audio only because you hate being on video. 
Maybe you are just going and posting uh, clips. Maybe you like designing cartoons. It could be whatever you want, right? But just be making content of some sort. The other thing is I think people struggle with the promotion narrative. A lot of people don't like to toot their own horn and that's that's fine. But content doesn't have to be salesy. It can be more informative. It can be educational. And a lot of times the best way to make content is not to think about just this massive audience, but it's really to just think about the one person. So think about the customer that you have or the the lead that came in two months ago that was really needing your help and you were able to have a great sales conversation with them that was educational, helping them solve their real problems, overcome the obstacles that they had, uh, understand that their misconceptions and doubts were in vain and that they can actually move forward with this project and it can be reality. Think about just that one person. Let's call him Mike. Think about Mike whenever you're writing the next social post. Anything that you said from that conversation. A great way to do content, honestly, is I don't know if you're recording your sales calls, especially if they're on Zoom, if you have a nationwide audience or you're remote. Just record those, go back and listen to any advice you gave and then turn that into a social post. It can be that simple where you're just repurposing what exists. But an, another- so, so, so can I ask, you know, how many times have you, have I looked at something over and over? I've re-recorded a 30 second clip in my warehouse because I just don't like how it sounds or looks. Is it better to be authentic and not perfect? Or do you really just try and keep recording until you get it the best way possible? Well, it depends what it is. Is this, you have to think about the shelf life of the content. Is this something that you're going to post to LinkedIn and then as soon as it's out of the feed, it's never going to be really seen again unless someone digs for it? No, don't worry about the production value. Don't worry about the mistakes and being perfect. Is this the first video that every single person that visits your website is going to see? Hey, let's make it a little bit more polished because this is an asset for the next three years, right? So it just depends on the shelf life and the purpose of the content. If it's just a little company update or a little question that you're answering in the form of video or a, a, a post, I wouldn't worry about it. Just be yourself. Ultimately, we're in this really interesting stage of content. It's one of the easiest things for AI to do, and it can do it at a very high level. But it's really the delivery of that content that matters. Uh, How are you going to position that content? Who are you speaking to? And how do you deliver it? Um, That's why, you know, I think long form podcasts are so great, is because it gives you an opportunity to speak your mind and to show your expertise in a way, in a delivery that AI isn't doing that very well now. But in terms of blog posts, AI can crank out blog posts in 30 seconds or less that are better than anything I could spend an afternoon writing. And that's, that makes it very difficult. Do Um, you, do you think about the content you're offering? Let's just say it's a social media post. Does it matter which platform you're putting it on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, at the end of the day, content is all about your customer, right? It, It, you've got to think about your target audience. If your target audience isn't on LinkedIn, do you don't need to be posting to LinkedIn. If you go where your target audience is, it's no different than location, 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 right? Whenever you're setting up a restaurant, you don't want to be out in the boonies where two people drive by a day. You want to be on the busy street corner that people park next to, they walk next to. It's it's a center of traffic that they see it and they say, oh, I should eat there, right? Yeah. Uh, just like being right off of the highway. There's a reason why all of the fast food chains have prime real estate right off of the exit. It's because that's where the traffic is. It's the easiest place to get to. So make so, it easy for your target audience to find your content. I, you know, this, I don't want to project my own hangups, if, if that's the right phrase. But I find, so if I think about LinkedIn and sure. I think about, um, Instagram, and I think about Facebook. Let's just take those three. Okay. I think about LinkedIn for business. And for me, Facebook is is really what my social and person, my personal is. I know there's people that use it for business and lots of businesses where it is appropriate, but it's not for me. So if you, if I don't connect oh, but with you, it. You have to understand business. that you're, you're more so B2B. You're, you're selling to other I, businesses. You're right. There are people that work inside those businesses that are on Facebook. But, you know, the other thing that you have to think about is there's channels inside of channels. Like you can have 
we've recently had to do a lot of okay pilot. okay neo yeah. if you're t making me take the blue pill to go down the you know no it's no, not I, that complicated but yeah. we 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 recently had to do a lot of hiring and we have way more success doing an organic generic post inside of a targeted facebook group a very specific facebook group than mm -hmm. spending $500 on facebook ads that's targeting that audience right 10x the amount of applications just by posting in the right group. So es essentially what we've figured out is, and you can run ads to people that are in groups and that helps. But if you don't have that component of, I know exactly where these people are and they're in that group, then, and you just do a spray and pray essentially to everybody on Facebook, you could be missing it out. And you could spend thousands of dollars running ads to you know, the spray and pray method essentially with, with your targeting even, but because it's in the context of being in that group and other people are sharing similar things and they go to that group for advice and they have an intent, when people are scrolling through their feed, their intent isn't the same as when they go to a group to see what's been posted recently, right? They're in a different frame of mind. They're scrolling through their feed because they want to see pictures of family or friends and they want to see videos of cute kids and viral videos. They don't want to see an ad for a hiring or for a service that you're providing. But when they go to that group, that's an industry group that's specific to their trade or whatever, that's where they're trying to learn. That's why they're trying to get some information. They're trying to, they're in the frame of mind of work. So anyways, that's, that's some, that's actually a really big point with content is a lot of people treat it like if you build it, they will come yeah. and you'll find so many people that will have a wonderful podcast or a, a, you know, an incredible blog with so much insights but they only put it on their website. And sure, if they do a really good job of SEO and getting some keywords inside of there and making sure that it's ranking high, they can get some traffic, but they're completely missing out because they've taken this approach of, okay, well, if I, if I write the blog, or if I post the video or on Spotify or Apple, whatever, I'll get people, people should, should listen. You know, they'll come to me because I have the best content, but it's not the best content that wins. Most times, I mean, it happens where the really good content wins, but it's really the best distributed content that wins. So you've got to make sure that you're getting in front of the right people and go where they are and distribute from there. Uh, that's what's going to get you to grow. That's what's going to get more people to see it. That's what's going to really get the eyeballs that you want for your content. You know, you, you just raised several great points. It's triggering more than a few thoughts. And so I've always thought of social media um, and you, you taught me this 18 months ago on the journey we've been on with the podcast. You know, I always, you, some of the listeners have heard, heard me say before, if you're going to sit down and have a 30 or 45 or 60 minute discussion, when it's done, it's like a loaf of bread and nobody's going to, you know, unless you are one of Joe Rogan's followers, right? Where you're going to sit down <laughs> for three hours and listen to the whole thing. Um, it's just not, it's just not normal. So yeah. Benali, Khalil's company taught me the value of slicing that loaf up into six, eight, or right. ten slices, and then, you know, the the, the snackable bite size slices. It's up to me to find the right intersections in social media world where the ideal customers that I want to talk to are, and 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 put a little piece at that intersection and. Maybe two, I'll do that with two or three different pieces. And if they never pick up more than those two or three clips, they've got something valuable and, and, and they're, they're valuable as a standalone. If it sparks curiosity, you might go and listen to more, take more of, of the loaf. But man, Khalil, I'll tell you, I never, that's not what I thought when I started this, but now I see. Um, it's what it is. And I really see the value of quality editing um, in order to just make sure that that's crisp, clear, you know, micro lessons or razor. It, you, yeah. The editing brings the point into focus. And so right. I, um, where well, that's what I, I mean by the delivery, like, yes, you, you're going to in multiple ways. The, the long form episode is a big ask for people to listen to. And you are going to find raving fans and people that this 100% applies to that are going to listen to our full episodes here on Experience Builders. Majority of people will find a clip and actually watch the whole thing because it's 
you know, less than five minutes long and it's specific to something they were just thinking about uh, or a question they had, right? And that's not as big of an ask. And you want to make sure that you're delivering that content to people in a realistic and engaging way. You know, enter, you, you have to be able to be entertaining with your content. And that's why AI is going to do, you know, probably a lot with content. There's video editing tools that, you know, put graphics together and they can make it engaging and all that stuff. But in a different way, like most people that are listening to this are a subject matter expert, I would imagine. They have some sort of expertise and it may be very specific. It may be fairly broad to the industry, but they know something and they know how to do it really well. That's what you need to focus on. And that's how you need to get your message out to the world is by focusing on that. Like Chris, we are going to have a huge challenge on our hands and we're not doing things right if we get a hundred thousand monthly listeners, because that means that like, that's too big for our target audience. Yeah. Our target audience isn't that large, maybe worldwide, maybe it could be. But for the most part, if we were hitting those kind of metrics on listens, we might need to rethink what we're doing. We're either being just insanely uh, entertaining in, in the format that we're talking, or we're just not delivering the right message. But well, as I'm so, I'm listening, I'm, I'm using myself as an everything you're saying is absolutely correct. We've had other episodes on the show that we've talked about that all now are coming together when we talk about understanding what our content offering is. You know, we've talked about identifying the importance of your ideal customer. If I know mm -hmm. who my ideal customer is, I know what intersections on social media to look for them at. Um, and if you're somebody who's targeting healthcare companies or you're, you're, you're targeting um, auto show type customers, you're going to be in different places on the B2B, you know, chat rooms and, and, in, in portals than um, somebody who's just, well, I'm trying to get 150,000 exhibitors in my database, which can absolutely just, I remember when we used to want to be that company decades ago. And you go, we're just choking ourselves trying to, thinking that more prospects in a database meant more opportunity. It absolutely mm -hmm. doesn't. Um, you talked about, yeah. we did a show a few, a couple of months ago on defining your unique selling proposition, right? Your content is going to be based around a big part of it is going to be based around that. So I'm, yeah. I love that. I mean, this is all tied together. Um, you know, you can, you can hit up our, us on our YouTube channel, all of these clips, full episodes. And then, you know, there's over a hundred of these short clips are there. So if you're serious yeah. about going, we got to start doing it differently. Let's face it. None of us are making our living cold calling directories and show books anymore. I'm not saying that yeah. might not be part of your mix. But you're better well, off intentionally going after a specific profile of customer that yeah. you've identified as a good fit for you. Would you Would you agree? Absolutely. And I think going back to the measurement piece, people create content and they may expect, well, I only got one like or I didn't get any likes or comments on this. Don't worry about that aspect of it. I think I told you, Chris, uh, early on. The only thing that you need to be focused on in terms of measurement for experience builders is how many people come up to you and tell you, hey, I love the podcast episode that you did, or I love that you're doing this or whatever. That's what you should be measuring. If it's resonating enough with people where they are thinking about it or they're willing to talk to you and give you a compliment, then you've yeah. done your job because it means that your message is getting out, that it's sticking. So you so let me get ask you, a what bunch you of likes on... Well, what do you right. say to the people that think it's about the number of likes or comments, or maybe they're able to track how many views they get? What, how do you, I mean, I would, you know, I, would, you I would venture to say that the most liked piece of content on LinkedIn for the trade show industry has n nothing to do with education or expertise or anything really of significance. It probably has something to do, I mean, maybe there's a huge announcement about a bill that was passed, right? Like breaking news that supported the industry. But for the most part, like if you go to any trade show company's page, their most liked piece of content is going to be, we're excited to announce that we just hired so-and-so or something along those lines, or we're opening a new office in this place. It's always an announcement that's going to get the engagement, the, the likes, the comments. You it's may not an brilliant. intentional lead generation community. Exactly. Right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, uh, if you create a wonderful lead gen campaign, maybe that's going to be a great piece of content. But for the most part, it's the things that are an easy ask 
It's easy to ask someone to like the, we just hired somebody. It's easy to ask somebody to comment on the new location and say, congrats. It's easy to say that, you know, to ask somebody to like on the, uh, you know, we promoted somebody, but it's a much harder ask to get someone to engage and comment on a post about, you know, the three things that kill every single trade show event. Um, yeah, that may get some attention and some engagement, but some people feel a little bit insecure about giving their thoughts on that. And so they don't, it's a harder ask for them to comment or to engage with. If, um, so if we have some listeners um, and they're maybe wanting to step it up on, on content offering, do you have any examples of sites or, or content providers that you like that you go, I think these people, this, here, here's a couple of great examples. You mentioned Simon Sinek earlier. Um, yeah, who, uh, yeah. You know, I think he cuts through the clutter a lot and, and is able to, um, but like anybody, right? I think there's some things you, they, it's a, it's a hit and uh, others, it's a swing and a miss. You know, I'm a yeah. long time Seth Godin fan, right? So there's Seth some, Godin's you know, great. There's, it, there's tons daily, of people out there. Yeah. His daily diary in my inbox. Sometimes I have time to read them and sometimes I don't, but every once in a while, one of them jumps out and slaps me in the face and goes, oh my God, this is brilliant, right? So, and what it's done is it's shaped, it's shaped my impression of him as a business thought leader over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, where the point is, I've paid to go to a couple of his conferences. That's how much yeah. I ended up valuing what he said. So, but anyway, who, who, is there anybody that turns you on that you can turn us on? Oh to? man, so many. Um I think a really business wise for yeah. the the business leaders that are out there that are trying to engage with more content, I think that Michael Girdley does an, a fantastic job of this. Uh, he's on Twitter. He's on he's he's on LinkedIn. He doesn't post much there. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. You can find him there. We can put links to him in the show notes. Um, another one that I think is tremendous is John Matzner. He's on Twitter as well. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he talks a lot about hiring and using the global workforce, but he does much more than that. He's talks small business, small SMB. Uh, he's a, he's a great follow it and listen. Um, other ones on LinkedIn specifically, I think that Chris Walker, he's the CEO of Paceto and chairman of refine labs. Uh, he, his Content is so niche and specific to marketing and sales and advertising, but just so detailed and analytical. I mean, it's really, really good. So those are some really good examples of people that are doing it right. Oh, no, thank but you. I think, I think for listeners, it's probably unrealistic. You know, I've been doing content for a long time and I'm not even at the level of those guys and don't feel like I can attain the output that they have. They have media teams of six, seven people just for their content, right? So that's maybe not the best example of like, hey, you should do it just like this. It can be an inspiration. But right. you know, for most listeners, I think what is feasible and what's really going to add value immediately to their company is creating an ultimate buyer's guide. I talk about this uh, a lot, but if you have a new person coming in your pipeline, they're ready to schedule, they're an opportunity for your business. They've got a scope of work, they've got a budget, and they have a timeline and they want to use you, can you answer every single question of every stage of your pipeline going through the process of from you know, first meeting, all of the sales process, all of the production process, all of the install process, and then post? If you outline just step by step by step, what is that process and what are all the questions that that great opportunity that just fell into your lap might have during that process, can you answer every single one of those? That will be kind of the foundation of your ultimate buyer's guide. And do you and recommend that, Khalil? Is that a is that a video log? Is that a written mm -hmm. almost a, whatever is easiest a, for a you? Paper, if you love talking on voice memos, kind of then record a voice memo. If you love writing things out on Google Docs or a, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, go and do that. If it's recording videos of you walking through the process, just create the content. And then think about all the expectations that you want to set during each and every one of those stages. And then after that, do what are the misconceptions that happen in each one of those stages that people have when they come to buy from you? 
And then after that, what are all the obstacles that you run into and that your opportunities, your uh, your leads, customers run into whenever they're dealing it with that step of the process? What are all of the unknowns that they need to know about that step in that process? What are all the additional opportunities that can build off of that process and that step of working with you? And essentially what you're doing is you're, for that one service that you offer, now as a buyer, I have this ultimate guide that I can reference, that I can I can see in a really nice PDF or slide deck. And then now you can use that for training for your sales team, for your project managers, so that they ex- understand exactly what the customer is going to be thinking about and how they uh, how they see it and how what we want to make sure we provide our clients with. So essentially, you're building out this content. And what's valuable about this content, I think if you haven't put two and two together yet, it's going to make you a much better company to work with. You've improved oh, your it make, customer it way experience. more efficient, right? You just I'm thinking right. about all of my, all of our uh, biz dev and, and account manager sales professionals who how many times with a with a project a, a prospect who's looking for a project for a trade show you're asking the, the, there's the same discovery questions the same presentation steps there's the same you know order of how you have to confirm the solution you can anticipate the changes and why they want changes, what they like and what they don't like. If you're documenting all that, which by the way, next question I'm going to ask you, is that living maybe on your website? But then when you get those email inquiries, you can yeah. take the clip or the snippet, or you can just direct them to a place without you having to spend an hour answering the same questions when you've already done it. So totally get it and see the exactly. value. I, by the way, I would see the value of making that a, a video, a watchable I mean, how many of us? So that's that's the next thing that you do once you have that guide is you record a video that you require any new prospects. Hey, we're so excited for our kickoff call. We're so excited for this discovery call. Before we have this meeting, it's so helpful. We make we we try to get all of our prospects to to watch this fifteen minute video that just really gives you a lay of the land of working with us and sets all the expectations and it. Usually we find that it makes our meetings way more productive because it answers 90% of the questions all of our prospects have. So if you'll please watch that before you come into the meeting, that would be so helpful for us. And that's content that's directly supporting your customer experience. If you want to understand the value of that in a real way, go and try to buy from you. Like you're the owner of your business or the general manager or whatever it is. Go to your website and act like you're a new lead. Go through the process of, okay, what's it like to buy from from us? And literally, if it's a phone call that's part of the process or a form fill, go and do it and act like somebody else and go through the actual process. And you will find very quickly all of the, the things that are gaps right now for your customers where they don't have the knowledge they need to make a decision with you. They don't have all of the, the decisions made and they're not being able to make those decisions because you're not giving them the information they need to make the decisions necessary. What's great about the ultimate buyer's guide, if you go through that exercise and it, it's not going to happen overnight, it's not going to happen in a week, and it should honestly be a living, breathing document that you develop over time. Right. But once you do have that, that is your roadmap, your, your uh, rubric for posting on social media. Take one of the things that you educate your customers on and make it a new post for social media. You don't have to change much about it, but you say, hey, this is how we approach this. When we talk to customers, we find that they often have this question. When we're going through our uh, production process, we always uh, like to talk to our customers about this obstacle or this misconception. Uh, And then you post those things and that's what's educating people throughout. Yes, this can live on your website, but it's It's not really just for anybody and everybody. And I really, like I said earlier, it's location, location, location. People aren't coming to your website to get information typically. They're coming to take action. Sometimes they're coming to get information, but that's really few and far between. Like, Chris, if you want to get information about me, you're not coming to my website. You're sending me an email. You're going on to LinkedIn and looking at our company page. Like, there's other ways that people have of getting information. And so you need to be where they are to get information. If it's a specific question, maybe you have a blog article about that specific question on your website so that you rank. And when they search Google for that specific question, you show up. But where else do they get their information? And that's where you want to be. So 
what's interesting, Cleo, is my, my business model, I couldn't give a rip about my Google ranking because we have such a small, finite, targeted um, group but that are a target audience. But um, just listening to you, here's what, here's what I just wrote down. So an ultimate buyer's guide, really, which is a central repository of how you know you're going to end up serving that customer. I can use it for training employees. I can use it for qualifying prospects. I can use it for for um, prospecting. I can use it when I need to explain what our process is. Um, graphic production is like the third rail in the artwork. There's an opportunity to pre-engineer and, and document what that is so you could quickly get that at somebody else. Our payment terms, um, ultimately your personal brand expertise is being built with all those things being sort of made and pre-engineered and put together. Your industry credibility goes up. Your, you know, you're, you're really, you're assuring your own efficiency by our, it forces you to kind of even define your process and you probably, am I wrong in saying you will find some gaps in your own company's process as you're doing oh, this? Oh, for sure. And you'll probably for close sure. those gaps too as you're just developing. We're talking about content development and look at all the things it touches in your professional life. So I'm a, uh, this is, um, this is way more than I thought this discussion was going to be, but you're, but I know this to be true because, um, you know, we took a long way around to, be credible in all those things I just mentioned. But I think if you were on the content development train and you're serious about, it focuses you to be serious about who your customers really are and who you're not, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to force you to be, who are we and who are we not? Let's, I mean, let's get rid of all the vanity things that we might post and put out there because we want to look good to, I don't know, friends, ourselves, <laughs> industry people that don't really have any business relationship yeah. with you and um no this is really uh good okay last thing um you and i talked earlier there's a lot we see that just you shake your head and you go what are they trying to do there um maybe it's to save a buck i see you know whether it's i'm recording my own videos with a homemade thing that kind of feels homemade and it's on it you know you just you're gonna be um you know, you want to go after Fortune 500 companies and, you know, I can see you shooting the video you're posting with your cat walking across the room in the background and, you know, you know, fill in the blank on what it is that's the tell that they're not, you know, you're not putting your best foot forward. What do you, is there any basics or that you could get people to go, here's what I would invest in or make sure you're at least doing this. I don't think you need. $5,000 worth of equipment if you want to start doing your own no. videos. I mean, the iPhones are all it pretty just, damn it, good right now. Yeah, for sure. You can absolutely use the iPhone. It, it totally depends on the channel you're on and the shelf life of the content. If this is going to be something that every single customer that interacts with you is going to watch, then you need higher production value. Um, if it's something that's going to live on LinkedIn for a week, I wouldn't worry too much about the production value. At the end of the day, if it's if you're really trying to build a personal brand or a personal connection with your audience, it's okay to have your cat walking in the background at the end of the day, on the on the shelf life that's three days, one week, it doesn't matter, right? And in fact, it can even help. It shows authenticity. Now, if that's the main video on your website and it's just you shaking around, like not not great. I think ultimately, it's a I'm question thinking of, of your met one person individual right now, uh, a person <laughs> in particular, which is not their best look. Let me just leave it at that. Well, um, I, I, I love it. I love your great point. Shelf life of content. Yeah. Tons shelf of life us of content put matters. something out that's just up for the week. But you're right. If this is a signature clip on your website or your LinkedIn profile, you, you know, and you want it to, I, I do. I find myself thinking about not mentioning years. I think about the, is this content something that <laughs> it's going to make sense five years from now? Right. Or yeah. are we talking about it something in an election year, in which case it kind of dates what it is you're saying. Right. Right. Well, you I think also you, you have to think about, you know, the production value versus the message. If you have something that's really great in terms of the message, expert insight, wonderful story, great analogy, really applicable technical and practical tips that you're giving, 
people could care less about the production value. Yeah, because man. you're I've, so I've engaged been distracted. with what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, and so I think we, so yeah. powerful with your message, man. Production value could go out the door. I could care less, but I'm I'm engaged because you're saying something that matters, right? I couldn't agree more. I've seen I've been turned off by too many bells and whistles in some clips I've seen where you just I'm trying to read it and it's changing color and there's a flashing thing here and there's there's hard fast cutaways every four seconds and I'm really just I'm I'm trying to tune in on them and yet I hear somebody who's a thought leader and that yeah. camera angle doesn't have to change for 20 minutes I'm riveted well, that, what Chris that's what we do if you think about it like our production value is fine, but it's not like over the top. We're not getting into a studio and recording yeah, with right. multiple camera angles and all this kind of stuff. And part of the reason for that is that's not our competition. That's not the industry standard. If somebody came out and started doing Experience Builders 2.0 with in-studio and crazy motion graphics and sound effects and all this kind of stuff, we may have to up our production value because that's where our competition's at. That's what our target audience is going to engage with that more because they also have the expert insights and the incredible stories and analogies and great uh, thought leaders on the show, and they're doing the production over the top. So that's where the, the target audience would go. But no one in our target audience is doing that, and really no right. one's doing it with the message that we have. And so that's why we're focused on not the production value and more on the content. Right, more on the message. No, so it, it all. Yeah, I no, I agree. We well, again, we're. I don't mean to focus just on podcasting, but you and I spent a great deal of time, not just on topics, but really weeks before seeking out the right subject matter expert to have the conversation right. with. Um, and I, you know, and when we hit it, it's gold, and um. You know, if you don't hit it, um, I'm not saying there's not usable information there, but it, you know, but then there's sometimes you just, I think it's going to be about content. And uh, I think right now I'm thinking about Julie Kagi from ESCA who was on, yeah. right? Shout out to Julie if you're listening. You better be listening, Julie. I'm just telling you. But um, we were really, she had given us an idea about a rebuttal to the grow with no. She's like, well, I was trained to never say no. So you should do a follow up <laughs> about that. And it led into this great conversation about service, the service mentality. And I remember, you know, how passionate she's like, listen, service is free and everybody can improve their service and the experience and showing empathy and being a good listener and all. And it, it was just a wonderful, uh, I thought it was a po really positive surprise what came out beyond what I thought we would get out of it. And we've had other guests like that as well. So, um, yeah. isn't that what we're really after for anybody here? If you're, putting yourself out in front of your clients or prospects, you want to be the positive surprise that's more than what they are showing up thinking they're going to buy. I like what you said. They don't go to my website to, um, they're going to, they already have something in mind about buying and they have a project in mind. They might be going to check me out looking for any sign of trust and credibility. And I think we have some evidence up there about my company in that regard. And so by the time they do connect with us directly, boom, we're, we're right into talking about an opportunity, a project they need help with, which yeah. is a lovely way to you know, start conversations in second gear, right? That's, that's great. Well, and, and that's the whole, that's a, I mean, we'll just touch on this briefly, but it's a concept called dark social. So you can, you know, and this really started with Google ads primarily of having this wonderful analytics pro, uh, platform where you could see exactly how much you pay per click and how many people clicked on it how many people saw it with impressions, and it gave you the very detailed analytics that people loved. And then people try to do that with every single channel where they want to know exactly how many likes are on a post and how many likes equals a uh, booked meeting for a lead. And then they want to see from their website how much traffic each equals a new opportunity and all these different things. But at the end of the day, it's it's not so robotic. I don't make every purchase decision just from one Google search, clicking on it, and then finding my product. It, yeah. I may see an ad or even just an organic video on YouTube or on Instagram or wherever I spend time. And they're like, oh, that's really cool. And then two weeks later, I come back and I see another one, right? I go and I look at their account and I find other videos that they have. 
And then they're in, in the back of my mind. And then suddenly a need arises and I think, oh, here's this, or even better, someone else has a need that arises. And I say, oh, hey, I've been watching all these, I've seen all these videos, you should check this people out. I think they'd be a great solution for you. And so then that person does a Google search and they go to your website and book the meeting or whatever it is. And the reality is it wasn't that that person had the intuition to just search your company name by name on Google. It's that you put out all this content that educated and engaged somebody on dark social where there's no analytics, very little measurement that actually is meaningful for giving you buyer uh, input that then gave a referral to you and they never even worked with you. They just engaged, they were a follower of your content. So that's kind of the value that happens out there. And I guarantee you, everyone who's listening to this has had that experience themselves where they, they use, they were in the dark social funnel. It is, I, it, this is worth saving. And I know, I know we're, uh, we, we need to wrap up here, but um, right. I had one. So last year we had one healthy six figure project that came to us from a, somebody that was, it was new, a new partner for us. And they said, I just want you to know the reason we found you, the reason we're using you is because of your experience builders podcast. I'm not saying that's the reason. That's how we found you. We listen to you. We recognize that you are a like-minded business uh, leader, like uh, in the throes of, of uh, in, in the, in the likes of what we are. Um, and then once the investigation and we understood you're in the right places and you've got the right resources, but you should know this is why this came to you because it really, so for so many people that do, um, that put content out there and it's tough to track directly, you know, where opportunity may come from. I was super grateful, um, when that happened. Well, so just the takeaways, Khalil, I'm, I'm getting here one, um, just, I love the fact we've defined the content is really a subject or an idea that can be, it can be written, it can be spoken, it can be visual, it's created, and it's, you're, it's representing something that you're, you're passionate about, you stand for. And it's, I think that that's sticking to you, that messaging and, and uh, that contribution communicates an idea that you have. Um, it's way more than just a podcast or a video. It is a written post. It's an email. It could be your monthly newsletter. It could be um, uh, email campaigns. It could be what's on your website offering. It's TikTok. But I, content is it's putting any of those written, spoken, created things out there, however you put them out there. And man, do not underestimate how that sticks to your personal brand as well as your company brand. Um, that's that's worth, I think that's absolutely worth taking away. Um, man, I love my big takeaway is going to be the ultimate buyer's guide. If you put something like that together, and I know that it's going to help me with training my people, it's going to help me with recruiting, it's going to help me with qualifying opportunities, it's a prospecting uh, aid, it, 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 it sets the table for anything I could talk about with my customers. It ultimately makes me five, 10 times more efficient because I don't have to reinvent the wheel every time because now I've documented it. Love the idea of having that. Um, I, and I think we've learned, um, by the way, thank you for the three great tips on where we can find some inspiration. Michael Girdley, John Matzner, uh, Chris yep. Walker. I hope you put them in the show notes because- We'll have those um, in the show notes for sure. This is what I do, man. I'm driving into work or I'm driving home. And um, sometimes I just want to hear music, but more times than not, I'm feeding the brain with something, particularly in the mornings as I'm coming in. So I like that. Um, what have I missed that was also worth mentioning on becoming better at the content? Uh, I think that's good. Uh, another person I'll recommend is, uh, you mentioned Seth Godin. So we, yeah. we'll put that in the show notes. And then another good one is uh, the author of Story Brand and Marketing Made Simple and all these different things, uh, Donald Miller. So we'll get links to him as well. He has a very similar to Seth Godin's daily diaries. He's got uh, daily videos that are that he sends to your inbox, and they're all fantastic. So I know we've um, talked Donald Miller before. So yeah, that's a good yeah. one. Well, Chris, thanks, man. This has been fun. Uh, hopefully, it inspires some of our listeners to go and create some more content. And uh, thank you, thank yeah. you. I hope the li listen Q two absolutely looks incredible for our industry right now. I hope everybody mm -hmm. else is feeling, they must be feeling it because if we're busy, 
they're busy because they're, they're the ones sending us the work. So glad <laughs> to um, glad to know that that's happening. And uh, let's keep rocking and rolling. Thank you for taking the time to, to take us through this cool. Absolutely. Thank you. See you. Right, see you on the next one. Thanks for listening to the Experience Builders podcast. Check out our website in the show notes or visit crewxp.com to learn more.